I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. It is the middle of the 18th century. A man named Sullivan is a criminal. He's a counterfeiter. He's in Providence, Rhode Island, which in 1750, 51, and 52 was a, a very poor version of what we see today. Its skyline was mostly dominated by taverns and trees, and it was a fledgling capital of the British Crown's colonies. However, Mr. Sullivan was a skilled counterfeiter in an era where paper money was always suspect and counterfeiters took advantage of that. He is tied to the uh, uh, proverbial pillory and he's about to be branded for his crime. This scene is one of the many colorful romantic moments in a new book, Moneymakers, The Wicked Lives and Surprising Adventures of Three Notorious Counterfeiters, one from each of the important eras leading up until the 20th century. We begin in the 18th century under the English king with Mr. Sullivan. Ben Tarnoff is the author. I congratulate him. Ben, a very good evening. Right to the pillory. Who is Mr. Sullivan? How, what does he do to make his money? Well, Owen Sullivan is an Irish immigrant who comes to this country in the 1740s, actually as an indentured servant, and he learns uh, metal engraving in the military. He fights in one of the many colonial wars, and by 1749, he's actually in Boston working as a silversmith, where he begins counterfeiting paper money in Massachusetts. Uh, by 1752, it's after his first arrest, he's already really launched his counterfeiting career. So now he's in Providence, Rhode Island, and he's just been arrested with his associate, Nicholas Stevens, and they're, they're about to be punished for counterfeiting Rhode Island money because they've already begun building a very sophisticated counterfeiting operation in the Northeast. Uh, Rhode Island money. Now, it's important here that Rhode Island is offended by counterfeiting Rhode Island money. It doesn't much care about counterfeiting, oh, say, Massachusetts money or some foreign money out of Pennsylvania, but Rhode Island money. So what is the punishment, Ben? Well, the punishment in this case, it varied by colony, but for Sullivan and Stevens, they were punished with a branding iron, which would burn the letter R into their cheek, and also to have their ears cropped. So some portion of their ears were clipped away. The interesting thing is that Sullivan is a very charming character, and he persuades the authorities to actually lighten his punishment. So the brand iron goes above the hairline, where it won't be visible, and smaller pieces of his ears are cut off than his associate, Nicholas Stevens, who receives the full just, punishment. Just fleshy parts. But the clipping, exactly. the clipping of the ears was to make certain, because this is an era before we had what you'd say digital IDs, and you weren't carted at the airport, that would make it clear to everyone forever that you had a criminal past and that you should be suspect. Precisely. And it's crucial that the nature of punishment in colonial America is very public. Because if you think about it, what counterfeiters are doing, they're undermining people's confidence right. in the colonial currency, which could be a real threat to the colonial economy. So you need to deal with them publicly and, and very severely to bolster people's confidence in the currency. Now, Mr. Sullivan had a very romantic childhood. He drifted. He was abandoned. He found his way to America. He sold himself as an indentured servant for the passage. And when he arrived here, he got a trait. Actually, he went off to Lewisburg. Didn't he fight with the, the crown against the French in Lewisburg? He did, exactly. Yes. And that was one of the great victories. This is the period of the so-called uh, French and Indian Wars that were fought between the French Empire in Canada and the British Empire in America. And what I like about your, uh, your anecdotes about Mr. Sullivan is that you see the world from a point of view where there is no America, where you're just dealing with the hardscrabble world of the colonies, and you have no particular nationalistic identity. You're a rascal. Right. You make your way. People die. People live. And nobody cares. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's really the, the idea of a modern American identity, obviously, at that point. Uh, it hasn't really been developed. And even basic things that we take for granted today, like cooperation between states, you know, intercolonial cooperation was very rare in this period, which made it quite easy for counterfeiters like Sullivan to hop jurisdictions. The book is Moneymakers, and we're now about to have an interesting collision with history. Mr. Sullivan, after having his ears mildly clipped, uh, goes off to a part of New York that is now in Dutchess County around Dover, Dover Plains. This is a part of New York that's not very far from where uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt grew up. And it's uh, the in-between of Connecticut and New York. So it's a, it's, a period, it's a part of the world that's even difficult today to say, 
who's in charge on this side of the border or that side of the border because a, sim- a single road travels, a single road crosses the border in a couple of places. I'm familiar with it because I've driven along and it's easy to get lost. He likes it because it's in the wilderness and there are large caves. One is so large they call it a church. And he meets a man named Rogers. Well, what does he want Rogers for? Well, Rogers is, a, is one of these fascinating characters in, in colonial America. What Sullivan does from, from the Oblong, which is this, this piece of land that you described between Connecticut and New York, he launches a series of expeditions to neighboring colonies, essentially to recruit accomplices. And one of them turns out to be Rogers um, in New Hampshire, in a fairly um, unsettled part of New Hampshire. And so he recruits Rogers to pass counterfeit bills that he's printed for him. Uh, the bills, we best describe them, Ben. What is a, what is a colonial period bill look like? And if you can find them on eBay and they're original or even counterfeit, buy them because they're very rare. Yeah, well, well, the first thing, you know, visually that I think is a little unusual for people familiar with modern money is that they're oriented differently. You know, our money tends to be oriented horizontally, like the modern dollar. But these are, are you know, top down, like the page out of a book. And very early colonial currency, you know, it dates back to 1690 in Massachusetts. The engraving is very, very crude. I mean, it looks almost like a, a you know, post-it note that someone had right. scribbled on. So right. it's fairly easy to forge. And uh, any forging at all has a, ha- has a significance to anybody who has paper money. Uh, at some point, everybody knew they wanted to be backed up by hard money. But depending upon the colony and the period, you couldn't do that. And there was always a shortage of a currency, something to exchange, something to barter. Sometimes it was corn, sometimes it was tobacco, and sometimes it was scrip. During the uh, the 1930s, Ben, I've read how they ran out of money in many parts of this country, mm-hmm. and uh, certain con- uh, certain regions generated their own scrip. They manufactured money that would substitute, and that's not unlike what they were doing in colonial period. But the significance here is that Rogers is a passer, and uh, you got to keep a percentage of the money that you passed, and that's the way it was circulated. But Rogers, uh, Rogers escapes final punishment. I think he's, he's a rascal, and he turns out to be very famous. Who is Robert Rogers? Well, Robert Rogers rises to prominence during the French and Indian War. Essentially what happens is that he is supposed to raise a certain number of men for the militia in New Hampshire, and what happens is once he's brought up on counterfeiting charges because he's caught in connection with Sullivan, he makes an offer to the authorities in New Hampshire and say, listen, um, I'm going to turn over my men to you uh, for this expedition if, you, if you'll let me off. So he, he becomes the head of what's, what's known as Rogers Rangers, um, and he develops a very innovative new type of warfare, which we would associate today with guerrilla warfare. He's essentially taking on the French Indian allies on their own terrain. He's moving with small groups of men. He's using the jungle very effectively. And today's Army Rangers actually think of him as their forefather. Right, and he had the good luck to be played by Spencer Tracy in the, in the movie yes, Robert, exactly, Robert's, exactly. Robert's Rangers. And although the, that told a fantastic tale, it left out this bit about his life as a counterfeiter and a rascal who know, uh, knew Owen Sullivan. I'm speaking with Ben, ben Tarnoff. Now, Mr. Sullivan... Uh, continued his career until he met the gibbet one day. Where was he hanged? He was hanged in 1756 in New York in what is now City Hall Park. And at that time, that's where they executed criminals because it was essentially the northern end of the city at that time. And he gives a pretty dramatic speech on the gallows, which is later reprinted and sold and becomes uh, you know, one of many kind of sensationalist uh, gallows literature of the time. Now, Ben, we're just going to entertain what stars should play Owen Sullivan in the historical movie that is uh, obvious from your presentation. <laughs> we're going to go to another period when we come back. We're off to the period of the second, uh, uh, the second bank and the fight between Andrew Jackson and Nicholas Biddle in Philadelphia. And a wonderful man, David Lewis, who is not only a rascal, he sees something that it takes 100 years for America to solve which is a national Federal Reserve system. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm continuing my conversation with Ben 
Tarnoff, whose new book, The Money Makers, is about counterfeiters and how they took advantage, like parasites, of weaknesses or what you'd have to say is inequality in markets. This is paper money in the Revolutionary and, uh, and pre-Civil War, the antebellum period, and we'll move on quickly to the period of the Civil War. But David Lewis uh, operates out of Philadelphia, and he operates in uh, Pennsylvania in the rural areas because that allows him to escape. But what was the condition of paper money in the 1820s and 30s, Ben? Well, paper money experiences huge explosion in this early, uh, early period of the 19th century. Contemporaries actually have a word for it. They call it a bankomania. And the reason for this is that there is an acute shortage of currency in America. So what the states do, state legislatures actually charter banks all across the country to print their own paper money. So you have hundreds and then later thousands of different types of notes circulating all around the country. And uh, David Lewis takes advantage of the fact that these printers all over the country in Tennessee or North Carolina and Florida aren't all uniform and you don't really know the money. You have to accept it from another region. And so he can print money in Philadelphia that can be passed off anywhere if you're clever enough and, have a, and talk a good game. Precisely. I mean, he is, he is in Pennsylvania in March of 1814, which is a crucial moment because the state legislature passes a bill which creates 41 new banks in a state that only had six previously. So there was a skyrocketing quantity of banknotes that enter circulation. And with so many banknotes in circulation, if you're an ordinary shopkeeper, it's very difficult to distinguish the names of these different banks. So it's very easy to pass counterfeits. Andrew Jackson had the election of 1824 stolen from him by the Federalists, but in 1828 he was successful. He won the presidency. He goes to Washington. He's an outsider, the first to break the mold of the North versus the South. This is a Western man. Jackson didn't trust a federal bank. In fact, he resisted the second bank. Why? And was that about banknotes? Was that about trust? Well, Jackson's uh, campaign to end the Second Bank of the United States, it's a, it's a complicated question of why he did it. I mean, Jackson himself held fairly contradictory views about finance. He said publicly that he would prefer a hard currency based on precious metals to paper currency, and he blamed the state banks in particular for bringing on the Panic of 1819. On the other hand, he came to think of the, the Second Bank based in Philadelphia as essentially an, an entrenched, you know, an instrument of entrenched wealth, that it was a tool of the ruling classes, and it was used to oppress uh, the farmers and the workers that really formed his political base. So, in fact, he had both things right, except that he couldn't put them together. Was it better to protect the money, the currency, the soundness of the dollar, or was it better to uh, play class warfare and get elected? I can't choose even now, Ben. Yeah, well, it, it's true, but there, there's also a cynical element to, um, to Jackson's calculation here, which is that many of his closest advisors, people like Martin Van Buren, actually have very close relationships with these state banks in states like New York and Pennsylvania who really want to get rid of the second bank because the second bank prevents them from being as free in their issue of paper money as they'd like to be. Now, the fun discovery of, of Ben's book for me is a man named Upham, Upham is a shopkeeper, and he lives during the Civil War period. This is 1860. Uh, the war begins in 1861, a uh, 6061. In 1862, we meet him, and where does he live, and what does he do, Ben? Because he's very different from Mr. Lewis and Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, he really is a unique addition to uh, to American counterfeiting history. He is living in Philadelphia in 1862. He actually runs a stationery shop on Chestnut Street in downtown Philadelphia. And one day in February, he sees a reproduction of a Confederate note, because at this point the Confederacy is printing paper money to fund the war against the North. And the Philadelphia Inquirer in February actually prints an image of this note. So Upham sees it and buys the plate from the publisher of the Inquirer and starts printing what he calls facsimiles of Confederate money. What's uh, the foundation for this is that Mr. Lincoln and his Secretary of the Treasury, as I recall, Mr. Chase, they needed to solve a shortage of money in order to pay the armies they needed to raise to resist the rebellion in the South. And so they went on something called the Greenback, which was very untrustworthy. Nobody much liked it. They all liked hard money. But it was mandated by the North, and the Confederates matched it with the Grayback. Uh, early on in the war, the grayback was significant. I think you have the metric, Ben, that on August 1st, 1862, which is before the defeats of 
uh, Fredericksburg, for example, later on in that year, uh, the, gray, the grayback was worth two for every one dollar of gold, which is a very good price. Mm-hmm. And, exactly. And it declined very quickly according to the fate of the Confederacy. But Mr. Upham, was he a real, was he pursued the way Mr. Lewis and Mr. Sullivan were per- pursued? No, I mean, what happens with the Civil War is it creates a unique opportunity for really a new kind of counterfeiter like Upham. And that's someone who can forge money without technically breaking the law. Because right. Confederate currency, of course, is printed by a government that's emphatically not recognized by the Northern government. So Upham is allowed to continue printing Southern money really with impunity for an entire year. And I wonder now if he was the secret weapon. In the Second World War, the Nazi regime actually had uh, a, an operation to print fake American dollars, and they were going to destroy our currency by disseminating that fake money. Some of it was confiscated, some of it still buried in secret mountains with thrillers to be written. Uh, and uh, Mr. Upham, uh, did he contribute? Can we, uh, with any certainty, believe that he threatened the Confederacy? Because you can see from when he starts printing, the, the Confederate dollar continues to decline. Well, he did give figures. You know, after, after this was over, about 15 years later, he estimated that he printed to- in total probably about $15 million of fake Confederate cash. Now, if all of that in- ended up in the South, It would have accounted for about 3% of the money supply, which is a tremendous amount for a single counterfeiter to contribute. And I think, without a doubt, certainly contributed to the depreciation of the Confederate dollar. Ben found an ad in Harper's, which was the national Internet service of the period. Uh, $500 Confederate bills, all types, for $5 in January of 63, which is uh, coterminous with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. So... You can get them both ways. And Upham is a hero. He should be, you know, he, he, we're, we do well medal him uh, for him, Ben. Definitely. No, I mean, he, he certainly contributed to the, to the war effort. And the federal government, in all likelihood, knew, knew about what he was doing and decided not to intervene because they knew it would have a, a favorable impact. The book is Moneymakers, The Wicked Lives and Surprising Adventures and Heroism of Three Notorious Counterfeiters. Ben Tarnoff is the author. I'm John Batchelor, checking my money. This is The John Batchelor Show.